Hey guys, welcome back to another youth group. I'm excited that we get to join together again tonight to lean into just what it is the Lord have for us, that we continue to come before him and his word, come into community and grow. And so at this point, we're like seasoned veterans at Zoom calls. So I'm excited that we can continue to leverage that for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of community, for the sake of Christ. Um, and if you'll remember what we've been doing, and it's what we've always been doing anyways this semester, just going through this book, of gospel identity and really the whole purpose and point of this book the question this book is trying to answer is why does christ matter for you why does the gospel matter why is the fact that this man from the middle east thousands of years ago died matter and what we're trying to argue is this reality that it changes everything that he makes us new and that it is good news you'll remember last week we talked about our union with christ that because of his love we are held on to that there's nothing that nothing at all that can separate us from his love. Remember we talked about in Romans 8 that neither heights nor depths, angels nor powers, nothing can separate us from that love. Tonight what we're going to be looking at is, is an incredible idea of looking at what is God's disposition towards us? How does he feel about us? What does he think about us? Um, and it's really easy to fall into Satan's lies. He sets up some pits and some snares before us to say, this is how God thinks about you. But scripture is actually very clear about how when we are found in Christ, how God views us. And so we're going to dive into that together tonight, is what is God's disposition towards us? So let's pray and then we'll get into it. God, thank you again for these students who continue to gather, who continue to come and be a part of your church. I ask that you would come, O oh Lord, and reign over this moment. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would remove any foolishness from my mouth as well as any distractions from others' minds and that we might together come and see you in your glory, in your goodness, and in your beauty. Please come and preach Christ to us, we pray. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So by way of opening, what I want to start with is a bit of a, a game, a little, a little trivia. You don't have to have a sheet of paper. There's only five questions, but if you want to get some, you can pause and get it now. But uh, here's what we're going to do to start out. So we're gonna be playing a game of what does that grow into? It'll start out a little easy and then get a little more difficult. We're gonna give a couple seconds for the first one and try and do no more than 10 seconds for the next. So here we go. Number one, what does this grow into? Okay, easy, I know, I know, but up the game here. What does this grow into? Okay, what about this little cute guy? And then this. And then finally, what does he grow into? All right, we're gonna do the honor system, so you guys score yourselves as you see is truthful. So first off, what does this grow into? Obviously, a frog. Good old tadpole. But this one makes it a little more difficult. My guess is that no one is going to accurately guess this because this is a crazy one. But if you did, well done. That is a baby ladybug. Who would have thought, right? From orange to red. This one turns into the always lovable sloth. Um, you could tell the eyes, hard to get away from those eyes. This one, a little easier again, right? Giant egg, turns into a giant bird, ostrich. And then finally, this guy makes quite the metamorphosis from this little white fluff ball into a flamingo. Quite the color change there. Um, but you know, and, and I guess the question I'd ask now is just, how'd you do? And, you know, some of you are probably saying, like, I got all blah, blah, blah. Um, 
I think what we expect now is that I would dole out, here's what's right, here's what you get if you got all five right. Here's what you get if you got four right. And what we're kind of like hardwired to believe is just that like, those who do the best should get rewarded. And those who do the worst should get punished. Even if that's something simple as just like, you don't get a piece of candy. But we live in this world in which success is met with reward and failure is often met with punishment. So the question for us tonight is, what does that framework mean for when we sin? How does God feel about us when we sin? Is he going to punish us? Is he frustrated and unhappy? Is he disappointed? How is God looking at us? The good news of the gospel, and what I'm going to argue tonight, is the reality that even as we're sinners, when we're found in Christ, God's disposition towards us is one of love. And what we're going to use to try and help us get into that is looking at the life of Peter. Peter's one of my all-time favorite characters in the Bible, and that's because Peter's such a bonehead. Like, Peter messes up a bunch and a bunch, a bunch. I mean, like, again and again, he is always messing up, and that gives me such hope because what we see is that doesn't disqualify him from loving and serving the Lord. Again and again, we see how the Lord moves towards him in that. But I want to give you a little picture, a snapshot of Peter's life, really his worst week ever. Um, and what's really cool is it actually, this week would have started tomorrow, right? Like this would have started on Monday um, or maybe just right before. Anyways, we're like right in it. The, the days right before Easter, um, is when Peter's worst week ever is. And I think one of our temptations is to make Peter and the other characters of the Bible, these like mythical heroes. And what I hope and what we're going to see is that you guys might humanize him. I'm going to use a, a somewhat silly illustration to show you about his worst week ever. Um, but I want you guys to think about Peter as one who is very similar to us with hopes, dreams, fears, doubts, and all the rest. Okay, so let's look at Peter's worst week ever. We're going to be using text messages, imagining what it would be like if they had cell phones back in the day. So it starts um, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, and if you might remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's pretty nervous and asks all the disciples to pray for him. And he goes off into the garden by himself and is sweating blood. He's so nervous and anxious about the cross that's coming. And he knows he asks his best friends, Peter included, to pray for him. But what does Peter do? Peter just sleeps it off, completely sleeps again and again. And so what we see right here for the first day is just reality that Peter completely abandons Christ, Jesus, his Lord and friend, in his time of need. But then it gets worse because after um, Judas betrays Christ, uh, and Jesus is arrested and all the rest. Peter gets kind of cornered by this little girl, and she's asking, hey, do you know Jesus? And Peter, you know, he's pretty clear. Nope, don't know him. Totally not, not me. I don't know that guy. But she comes back. She's like, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that you did. But Peter doubles down. Not me. The little girl is adamant, and she's like, it was you, I know it. And Peter, for the third time, denies Christ and flees. And so what we have here is this kind of second scene of Peter's just like worst week ever. is him denying Christ, saying, I didn't even know him. But then it gets worse, right? Because then Peter, or excuse me, Jesus goes before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate says, listen, I'm going to release one of these prisoners. It can either be Jesus or this guy, Barabbas, who was a known wicked criminal. And the crowd goes crazy because they, they don't like Jesus. And so they are like, we want this other guy. And you can imagine Pontius Pilate being like, seriously, nobody wants this Jesus guy? And Peter, to his shame, is silent, is utterly silent. But the worst part of Peter's week this week is the reality of when Christ was dying on the cross. After he breathed his last Peter is nowhere to be found. He is completely absent. This has been a terrible, terrible week for Peter. And what I want us to remember here, right? This is his worst week ever. But what I want us to remember is that this is one of Peter's very best friends. 
Christ is one of Peter's greatest friends on the planet for the past three years. Three years, Peter has been with Jesus almost every waking moment, right? He's been with him for all the miracles. He's heard the teachings, all the rest. And Peter knows he's the Messiah on top of that. And so how do you think God the Father and Jesus, his friend, would feel about Peter after this week? After this week in which Peter has abandoned, denied, and totally left Christ. The words that came to my mind were like traitor, right? A fake, two-faced, um, just a sinner and possibly even an enemy. That is how I so often would believe. And if I was Peter, I would believe the Lord would be looking at us. Where we're going to pick up in scripture is a passage right after Christ's resurrection, before he reveals himself to the disciples. And we're going to see how Christ actually injures and engages with Peter and God's disposition towards Peter, even after his most painful and public sins. This is from John chapter 21. It says this, it said, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, they being the disciples, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Peter, Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Ladies, I want you to pause the, um, the talk right now. And I want each of you just to very quickly say, what's one thing that stood out to you in this talk? What's one thing, or excuse me, in this, in this passage of scripture, what's one thing that kind of grabbed your attention? All right, guys. And from this beautiful story, one of my favorite stories in all of scripture, we're going to look and see just a couple things. There's two points that we're going to try and drive into from this story to show God's disposition towards us. And what we're going to see first is how our own sin leads us to believe lies and moves us to a place of shame. Looking first to see how just sin often moves us to a place of shame. But then to look and see how does God move towards us with this restorative love that makes us new? We're going to look and see that God's disposition towards us is one of love. So first we're going to look at the ways that our sin drives us to shame and then look and see God's disposition towards us is one of love. Um, I know this is where it's really easy for us to jump into the stories, actually jumping in with Peter, right? In that first couple of verses, right? When he's moving to a place of isolation, because when we sin often, the first place we go is to a place of shame. We're particularly vulnerable to Satan's lies after we sin. He ramps up his work to help us believe in those lies in that. Imagine with me, perhaps, um, <coughs> one of you has spoken behind your friend's back, has just said just like nasty, untrue things about that friend to somebody else. And then perhaps after that phone call ends and you're alone in your room, which is easy to imagine right now, where do your thoughts go? I think if you're anything like me, where my thoughts would first go is just like self-justification. Like, listen, that friend doesn't really deserve my like secrecy or actually they don't deserve me to be kind to them because they're rude and unkind to, to other people. So I was justified to say that. 
And then I think we're honest, we start to move to this secondary emotional place where we move into a place of shame when we feel the weight of what we've done. And this is where we love to believe lies. We believe the lie of God is disgusted with me, that God couldn't ever use me, and God most certainly doesn't love me because I've done something as ugly as that. And brothers and sisters, what I want to tell you is that is a lie from Satan. The reality is, after we've sinned, we're particularly vulnerable to lies, which move us to this place of shame. This is where I often lived and continue to live, is this place of shame. And growing up, one of the ways that was really apparent, I remember this time, that um, we did Pinewood Derby cars, um, and my dad made these, like, awesome Pinewood Derby cars. I was a kid everybody hated because I was never allowed to help work on one. My dad just made these, like, pieces of art. They were gorgeous. One time he made, like, a literal killer whale, and it was awesome. Um, but as a kid, right, like I still want to play with them. And so dad had spent hours and hours making these things. We'd go lose all the races. And then I come home and I just want to play with them all over the place. I remember I broke one of them. I broke one of them and I was so scared. And I went to my dad and the look that he gave me was just one of just like disappointment and frustration. Just like, really Clay? Really? And that is exactly how I think God looks at me when I sin. That's exactly how Peter felt in this story. Look and see what Peter was doing in those first couple of verses, right? What was he doing? He was going off fishing. You might remember that was his job before he met Jesus. And you can imagine Peter's feelings as he's out in that boat fishing, thinking about all he'd done this past week, this worst week of his life, and being like, yeah, I don't deserve to catch any fish. There's no way God could ever love me. I think what Peter shows is how quickly we move into a place of lies and shame, and we believe God is against us. What's so beautiful, what this story shows forth in an incredibly beautiful way, is that God's disposition towards us isn't one of frustration and disappointment, but one of love. One of my favorite verses we're going to look at now that helps kind of like distill all of this into one verse is actually the first verse of Romans chapter 8, which we, we studied last week. Um, but look with me at this verse. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What this means is that there is no blame, judgment, no way that you will be hated by God because you are found in Christ. And guys, we see this so beautifully in our story when we look at Peter, right? What did Peter do when he saw Jesus? Did he shrink back in fear? No, he leapt into the water, swam, ran to Christ, and Christ embraced him. What we see here is this verse played out in incredible narrative form in that Christ, to the one whom he should have had the most pain from, moves towards him in love. God does not condemn Peter. He loves him. Just like the father in the prodigal son story, he does not cast out the one who deserves it, but invites him in out of love. God's disposition towards you, brothers, sisters, is one of love. And the beauty of the gospel is this. Like why this matters for us is because we deserve that wrath. Just like Peter, right? Peter deserved to be hated. We were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We are rebellious sinners. And yet Christ. And yet Christ came and bore the curse upon himself, becoming cursed by hanging upon the tree, taking off all the sins of the world upon himself, including the deepest, darkest secrets of my own heart. And he makes us new. And he comes and says, you are my beloved. I cover you in my love. What we've been looking at all these weeks is just the reality of this gospel, that the redeeming love of God finds its embrace in Christ when he comes and makes us new. We are called sons and daughters of God because of Christ and his work. And all that we deserve to be hated for is washed away under the love of Jesus. What was really cool in this story, back in, in the John um, narrative about Peter, is not only does Christ embrace Peter, he also empowers Peter. That whole second bit where Christ is asking the same question again and again, Peter gets exasperated. Why did Christ do that? 
because Christ is systematically undoing Peter's denial. You'll remember, Peter denied Christ three times. What Christ does here is three times ask him, do you love me? And lets Peter atone for that. Let's Peter say, yes, I love you. And what Christ is doing is empowering Peter and saying, listen, I know you love me. Peter even says that you know all things, right? Jesus does it to show Peter, not only do I love you, I know that you have more to give and that I want to empower you to go and do that. This is what is so beautiful about the gospel. Not only does it save us, it unleashes us unto flourishing. And that means like living our fullest life in Christ, using our gifts for his kingdom, which is eternal. Christ is showing us, you are so beloved by the king. And so guys, as we're sitting at home and perhaps maybe leaning into sin more, and moving to that place of believing the lies of God doesn't love me, and sitting in that cave of shame. Remember the truth of the gospel. Remember this sword. Remember the verse from Romans, this reality that God's look upon you is one of love. Because of Christ, we are made sons and daughters, and that he has come and covered us in his grace. So let us together, as his people, lean into that love and believe that God looks upon us and because of Christ, smiles. Have an awesome time in small group, guys.